Ping. I'm Commissioner Zoe and welcome to my public accountability for North Yorkshire Police, which I will be chairing today. So we'll go straight to the agenda. So agenda item one, which is attendance and apologies. There's just one apology today and that's from Lisa Winwood. Uh, agenda item two, minutes of the previous meeting and actions. Well, there's no actions and the minutes of the meetings are always um, held as a record and published onto the OPFCC website. So agenda item three, questions from the public. We have no questions today, but please, please to the public, keep them coming in these questions. We really, really appreciate them. So agenda item four, which is the presentation on customer contact, something that I'm very focused on. So I'm gonna hand over to Fiona to do the presentation, please. Good afternoon. Um... I'm Superintendent Fiona Woolley, I'm currently Head of Customer Contact for North Yorkshire Police. So are you happy for me to share my screen? Yes, please. Okay, I'll oh. see that. So um, the first slide just talks about, um, obviously, some of the questions that were put to the PAM earlier on in the year, um, and obviously just to provide some um, background and information apologies for that, just that, um, on, on where we are and how, how we've moved forward. So first one was improving uh, emergency and non-emergency call handling uh, and looking at our resource levels in proportion to that demand. Um, improvements are sustainable and plans are in place to maintain those improvements and looking at our retention and also our enhancement for development and training. Um, and looking at um, understanding and interrogating our data um, looking at the customer contact to improve the workflow, again, looking at our resourcing, the demand profiling, and also the appropriateness of demand for leasing. Uh, partnership engagement, which is obviously really important uh, in terms of um, force control room, looking at how we can get the right response by the right people um, to make sure that we are protecting those most vulnerable and get the right care for them. And then changes to customer contact options and police accessibility. So this is looking at the different routes and ways that the public can report to us but also how we are dealing with that so whether that is that low level uh, crime um, and different um, different work streams to sort of meet that demand really so that's what we'll hopefully cover um, in this presentation so just wanted to obviously put a bit of context behind so obviously staffing numbers at the moment and uh, excuse me for the abbreviations i will cover those so where it says comms fte so that's our communications officers um full-time equivalent which is 86 people but we look at a 10 percent above that uh, because we do have quite a high attrition rate within the force control room similar to call centers across the country um, so we always try and uh, recruit above that FTE number um, to take that into account. Currently in post, uh, we've got 87.99, so obviously we want to get to 95, so we're slightly below that at the moment. Our dispatch, so dispatch officers are those where once the calls come in, they go to our dispatch officers who will then liaise with those officers on the front line and make sure that we've got the right people going to those jobs and dispatched in a timely manner. Um, to, to go and obviously service the, the members of the public. So again, that's sat at 60 uh, with a 10% margin again, and we've got 62.39 currently on paper in those posts. So in August, um, we had a lot of vacancies from August, so just to give a little bit of background as to why we found ourselves low on recruitment uh, coming into this year, um, we had a freeze on recruitment Due to COVID, uh, obviously we couldn't recruit um, as many as we wanted to during that time. We had to reduce the size of the classes, um, obviously to, to try and reduce that um, infection rate to keep people safe. Um, and we had a critical systems update, which meant that we had to basically implement it on a live um, platform. So that took precedence over any training or recruitment that we could do during that time. So that's that's kind of why we're in the position we are uh, or were earlier this year in terms of our uh, recruitment. Any Fiona, yeah, yeah, sorry, Fiona. Can I um, can I ask a couple of questions, please? So, the COVID reduction in class size is that back up to full complement now? It is. We're actually we've increased our um, class sizes now. So we were looking at fourteen. Um, we're now looking at a capacity of up to twenty five. So we're, we're actually trying to increase the size of our classes now. And when do you expect to have um, 
you know, a, a full complement, especially in the comms? So we have just gone out to recruitment. Uh, we're interviewing this week and next week. And we've got a chat call starting in January of 25, hopefully. Um, that will take us up to our 95. And how long does a course take for them to be trained up? It's 12 weeks at the moment, uh, but that is getting reviewed uh, alongside a lot of other processes and procedures as to how we can improve our after-call service. Um, there's a lot of processes and, and procedures that have been embedded within the force control room um, over years, if you like, that need reviewing and seeing whether we need certain qualifiers um, so that's all getting looked at. Um, so that will impact on the costs, which we want to hopefully try and reduce, because that will also appeal to other people rather than thinking that they're on a 12 week course. Now, you do have a lot of turnover and staff in the force control room. And um, it's for me, it's like, how do we look after the staff that they all work extremely hard? The staff that leave, do we have those exit conversations so we can, you know, gather that data as to why they're leaving? And I know quite a few leave sometimes to join the force as full, you know, as full-time police officers. And I just wondered, have we got anything in, in place now that controls that or, or, or gives us better knowledge so we can get more of a, a grasp on those that are leaving us for whatever reason so we can gain that knowledge? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, it isn't an easy job. Uh, it's a very demanding job. It's a multi-skilling job. Um, you know, we do know that through the courses that some people come in and actually it's not what they thought the job was. So we, we accept that that's going to be the case. Um, and there's not real one thing, to be honest. Some of them, like you say, they're leaving because they see it as a stepping stone to move into other areas within the police family, which is brilliant because we still get to keep them. Um, and we've had a real mix this year. People have gone overseas. It's not fitting their personal circumstances. Um, the job's not for them. And some of them, you know, we will admit that it's not, they haven't felt valued. Um, and that's something that I take personally and make sure that we are looking at that. Some have had exit interviews and some have chosen not to. And those that have, we've taken that on board and we're starting to look at how we can do that. And we've got to involve your staff in that room as to what we're doing, making sure they're involved in that. Yeah, because I think that's really interesting. And that was going to be my next question to you. How do you involve the staff in um, doing upgrades to the force control room? Because quite often they can come up with fantastic ideas because they're living and breathing it all the time, aren't they? And the other thing I want to ask you about, that at the moment they do 12-hour shifts, it, do you think that's too long as a shift? Um, because I know it has changed over the years, hasn't it? Um, and I, I just wondered what your thoughts were to that. Yeah, so the first question then, um, so since I've been in post, so forgive me, I've only been in since September, so, um, but um, basically my morning starts with me going in the room and I start with the comms officers and I speak to every individual person in there, asking them how we can improve things, because they've got the ideas, they're doing it day in, day out, I, you know, that's, that's not me. Uh, I've done what you're going to hopefully do in December, which is listen to the calls so I can see what type of calls they're getting and give them that confidence so that they can deal with them appropriately and, and as best that they can do. Um, and anything that we're doing now, we're starting to involve them in any of the changes. Um, you know, an off, one of the comms officers um, came up with, why can't we change the front end of the call, you know, when you ring 101? Um, so I set in the task, has gone out and done a lot of research with other forces, and we're looking to change that next week. So they feel that they're being listened to and, and valued. Um, in terms of your second question, the 12 hours, um, so at the moment we do seven, seven days, seven, seven nights, but we have a hybrid as well. So we have people doing like a two, two or a three, three, because we know that a lot of our demand is certainly that later shift. Um, we're hoping that we start to look at um, like a workforce management tool to really understand where our demand is. And then we can get more bespoke shift patterns because we know that there'll be people that are part time or have children, families, caring yeah. commitments that we can really start to appeal to, that might only be able to work from six till midnight or, you know, where those peak times are. So there's certainly work to be done and something that I've got an appetite for. Thank you, Fiona. Great. Um, so just touching on demands a little bit then. So um, our 999s are reaching over 10,000 uh, a month, and that's uh, been basically a double uh, increase since 2012. 
that's not just North Yorkshire, by the way, that is nationally. Um, 101, we're reaching over 18,000 calls. That was for October alone. So again, we are seeing an increase in, in calls coming through. Um, Holds for the operator. So if you haven't run 101, you get a various number of options. And one of them is that you can speak to an operator and they tend to go through to our front counter, counter staff. Um, so it's not just people in the force control room in the calls. It's our front counter staff as well. So they have a real big part to play. And then the queue buster, um, which holds about 4,000. Now, obviously, if we get the staffing in place and we get the calls answered, we won't need the queue buster, but it's just to give you context of where we are at the moment. Um, I touched on single online home. We've got 100 reports a week at the minute. Uh, they do take longer to deal with, um, but obviously it's a slower time, um, which gives us that capacity. We are hoping to promote that. And again, going back to the changing of the message when you ring 101 we'll start to really promote and advertise the reporting online which gives people another method um to do so hopefully we'll see an increase there and that again is something that our front counter staff can deal with so it's taking some of that demand away from our control room and then we also deal with outbound calls so it's about thirteen thousand a month on average that we need to make those calls back to members of the public Fiona, why is the single online home, when you explain it as it is slower for you to action, why is that? So, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of information missing. So we sometimes have to call the person back or there's no telephone number on it. So then we have to do some research to find out how we can contact that person. Um, there'll be emails missing. So some of it is an admin error, but it's a national form. So we have... We have little guidance on governance over it at the moment, but um, and, and it's like anything, something new that's coming in. I think once we get used to it and the public get used to it, then that certainly will start to speed up as well. OK, thank you. So some of the uh, strengths for us then. So I talked, of, I came in in September. We have got a new management team in the force control room. Um, so this can obviously have its disadvantages because obviously we're new to it, but we're also seeing seeing things probably in a, in a little bit of a different light as well. And as I said, really involving the team on, on how we can change and, and improve how we're doing things. Um, we've implemented a, a daily huddle, which this is basically a pace setter. So this is literally no longer than 15 minutes. And it's it's asking, looking at what calls we might have missed. So anything over two minutes, making sure we've done that service recovery. Have we, have we missed anybody? Have we missed any threat and harm? What can we do to recover that? Looking at resources and so making sure that we've got resources to meet the demand for that day and, and having that horizon scanning so that we're not coming into the day short of the people that we need to answer those calls. And the implementation of a performance framework, which is, is again, looking at how we value our people through um, independent performance reviews. So having that one to one, that sit down and that, that chat. And then we've got team performance meetings, which is looking at the teams individually as how they're performing where we need to improve and obviously where we're doing really well and sharing that work. And then we'll, that feeds into the, the quarterly performance meetings with the, with the ACC. Um, so that's just starting to get embedded now. And, and it, it has changed the mindset of people in there because they've got accountability now to start to look at their individual teams, how we're performing, what we're missing, what we're not answering. Um, so that has, is making a difference um, and it's, it's driving that priority on a daily basis. Yeah, Commissioner, just to come in on that on that point, really, just in terms of a, a performance framework and the the drive that uh, uh, Fiona and, and Andy Nunns, who's the Chief Inspector, and Jane Larkin, who's the Control Room Manager in there, that, that I have an expectation on a daily basis that they are interrogating what's happened over the last 24 hours um, and they are looking forward uh, over the next uh, at least 48 hours, one in terms of staffing or the main one in terms of staffing to ensure we can answer those 999 calls as quickly as possible and the same uh, with the 101 calls. Just in terms of that though, so we will compare how people are performing as individuals within the control room, but on, on, on the, the, the on another side of that, we need to look after the welfare and well-being of those individuals. What we don't want to do is apply pressure in terms of the quantity. We want to answer more calls because we've still got to maintain a quality. So with the victim services assessment, which um, is conducted on a regular basis in terms of how we are treating these people when they're, when they're ringing up, how we're grading those calls uh, appropriately. We want to make sure we maintain the high standard that I believe we have. 
um, but also trying to improve uh, and reduce the, uh, the, the the call wait times uh, for 999s and 101s. So it's, it's imperative that we get that balance. We don't want to apply too much pressure because those individuals in there are working in an incredibly stressful environment, um, which is why Fiona's looking at um, a, a, the well-being of the individuals in there from a welfare point of view, looking at uh, staff recognition. So we need to make sure that they are the, the most valuable resource within there, and especially the call handlers, the ones who are there taking those 999 calls. It is not for everybody. It isn't something, personally, as a senior police officer, that I think I could do very well. Uh, but the people that we are recruiting, we've got to support. But we've got to make sure that we have a minimum standard in terms of how we expect them to perform, which you would expect in any industry. But certainly around this, that's something that Fiona and the team are, are progressing quite well with. Yeah, I must say, actually, Mike, you know, not only is it looking after our staff, because, I mean, I've been in the force control room before, and it's a very stressful environment. They're under a lot of pressure. And I suppose I do have concerns about, you know, if you start making too many demands on, you've got to get through all these calls, which I completely accept, but they're working extremely hard to cover sickness, to cover uh, vacancy gaps as well. Uh, but it's right that we should have high expectations of each other. I get that, absolutely. And it's also important that um, the public receive a really good service, that they're not ushered through too quickly and that they get the service they require and need from that call as well. Jenny, uh, Jenny Je sorry, Fiona, can I just bring Jenny in as well, please? Hi, thank you, Zoe. With that in mind, um, Mike, I know you just talked about uh, the fact that you're looking at the kind of the victim satisfaction side but how are you judging that at the moment and what are you hoping to do moving forward in relation to that? Well we've looked from the HMIC FRS who conduct um, a VSA audit that they're some of the key things that we will look at uh, in terms of how we've graded those calls and how we've deployed to them that's a key one that we're really focusing on at the moment um, that is the key inspection regime for the police, and that's the one thing that we'll really take take note of. But we also do a lot of call monitoring ourselves. Uh, we don't we don't need to wait until we're audited. We know what the standard needs to be. The role of the supervisors within the force control room is to ensure they're doing that continual auditing. They are sitting with people and listening to past calls. And sometimes when we will get a complaint through where we feel where a member of public feels it's not been dealt with correctly, there's a set process for going back through and listening to that. But we shouldn't have to wait for those we should be dip sampling and that's what always has happened in the control room but it's something that we need to continue to do even though we're under a lot of pressure to answer the calls and everyone's very busy we still need to maintain that dip sampling um so that's what we continue to do at the moment Jenny. thanks mike and, and that leads on really to the where it says focus on skilling and availability so you know that we've got some software within the force control room which basically allows the deployment managers to look at what people are doing whilst they're sat there so um whether they are needing a break and we've got a really tight schedule for the breaks making sure that people are having those breaks they're leaving the room to have that break getting that headspace um, and that downtime when it's absolutely needed so we really do monitor that through the it's called the ccma but that's the software program um, but that also helps us look at, so what we implemented in November is that we have five people dedicated to 999s so that we've always got somebody available to answer those 999s, which was why you'll see we've had a slight improvement in November. Um, we're looking at how to do this. Obviously, if someone's on nines all day, how was that for their mental well-being? Um, and some teams are, are asking the staff, how do they want to do it? So they do, do they want to do a day of nines and then do one on ones the next day? So they've got that freedom or some teams are, are opting to do um, half a day on nines and half a one on one so that they've got that flexibility and that they're not always in that real sort of threat and harm um, position. Um, we are then looking to, to do the same with the one on ones because um, we have had an increase in the one on ones. We know that because we focused on the nines. Um, we knew that was going to happen. And, and what, what we predicted has, has, has taken place, but we're now starting to look at, right, we've done that for the nines, let's do that for the ones. What we need to do is reduce some of that admin side so that we have got those people in the control room available to do those calls and take the admin somewhere else, but so that we're still meeting the needs of the public, but concentrating those comms people on, on answering those phones. Because, and the, the one big thing, uh, Commissioner, 
is since we've dedicated people on the nines and when you last went in, but the board beeps, as you know, mm. if we go over our SLA, mm. which is, can cause us some anxiety to some of our staff, which is the feedback that we've got. Um, now, since we've done the dedication, that board has hardly bleeped and that's automatically started to make people feel better in that room. I would like the confidence to turn the beep off. I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but they know that shall we start to get to those nines, that is a possibility um, for, for us to work towards. And we know it's had an improvement already. Fiona, can I ask about um, your busiest times? Have you identified that for 101 and 999s? And is, are you specifically putting um, staff on in those particular time slots, dedicated staff? Um, it's quite difficult for me because the information I get through um, is an average, an average call answer time for 999 and uh, 101, which is taken over a 24 hour period. So I don't know how quickly you are answering the phones in the busiest times. Um, and that's some information that I would like from you, from you, definitely. But so have you identified when your busiest times are to allocate staff, for example? Yeah, so one of the reasons why we put that hybrid 12-hour shift in was because um, the new the new demand time really is 6pm. Um, and if, if you're in the force control room at 6, then I can't guarantee that that board won't beep because that is uh, a really busy time for us. So that's why we have the overlap um, of, the, of the staff coming in from 2 o'clock in the afternoon so that we've got people embedded. As you know, we have a 7-7 seven, seven and a 7-7, seven, seven, so we're managing what that handover looks like so that we've got that resilience for that, that demand. So between 6 and 8 is one of our peak times, and then at the latter end is between 11 and 2 a.m., 11 p.m. and 2 a.m., and then it, it kind of drops off after that, so we can reduce the staffing in the early hours. They tend to do some of the admin work, bits and pieces during that time. Uh, which isn't ideal because people are tired and, and fatigued as well. However, between six, so that's where we want to start to look at what does that recruitment look like for that, that later shift. Um, early mornings, we've started to see a peak when people are starting to go to work in the darker darker mornings and, and the weather, certainly with road traffic collisions and things like that. Um, we're always going to get a flurry on, on certain things, unfortunately, but we'll try and get you that, that data because we're trying to look at the dashboards at the minute to see how we can get you that real time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we talked about recruitment drive. Obviously, we're looking at the increase for January intake, which we are on track um, to achieve. Um, so that will see us uh, meet our FTE. Um, and then obviously, we'll look at further recruitment going into the year because it is a constant thing that we need to do. Um, and, you know, the recruitment drive this time has been really good. So we've we did a, a question and answer on Instagram Live and also Facebook. Um, which we've got some really good interaction actually from the public. So we need to we need to continue that and look at different ways that the public can interact with us through those recruitment drives. Um, and the familiarisation event as well, we had uh, in excess of 38 people attend. Um, so they got a presentation, then they got to look around the control room. They got to listen to a couple of calls just to sort of see how would you answer that, what are you thinking? So it kind of brought a little bit of reality um, to, to them so that they knew what they were applying for and the interviews are on this week and commissioner i think realistically um what we've proved over the last month with this recruitment campaign is that if we use as many channels as possible we can really we can become an attractive employer in terms of the control room i think what we've found um certainly over 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 this year is don't think our recruitment campaigns have really gone as, as far and deep into the communities as, as we wanted them to um, uh, and that's maybe a bit of a back um, a lag from COVID and, and the events not taking place, etc. But we've um, we've now proved to ourselves that actually, with the right mechanisms, Instagram Live, Facebook Live, inviting people into the control, that's what we have to do. Because a lot of people will sit at home thinking, I've seen that on the TV, I don't think I could do it, or I do think I could do it. Well, actually come in and actually see it. See, uh, uh, we'll ask whatever question you want to ask, appropriate question on Instagram and Facebook, and we'll answer it because the people who are answering it, the people who who are doing the job. So that then helps us when we want 25 people to start the course on the 9th of January, 25 to finish the course three months later. What we don't want is 25 to come in and 20% and of them to think this isn't what I expected because that can happen and has happened previously. 
or we were due to have 15 because we've had we've set 15 throughout the year which is why we haven't made the target 15 haven't turned up only 10 have turned up so we're already behind um, uh, behind the game in terms of getting the numbers in so i think what we've done over the last month and it's been a team effort and it's put pressure on our recruitment teams it's put pressure on uh, fee and the team within the force control room but it's it, it's been all, all hands to the pump and we've just proved to ourselves we can do it um, so, you know, it is it is really good and we're hoping then that the attrition, which is around 20% in the control, which is high, we want to try and reduce that. And as you mentioned earlier, we do speak to people when they leave. We do find out the reasons for leaving. If it's around salaries that are increased elsewhere and stuff, then those are the conversations you will have with me, uh, Fiona Will, in terms of, well, they're leaving because they've been paid uh, X amount elsewhere. And those are conversations I will have then with the rest of the chief officer team to see what considerations we can give to those things. But no, it's been a really good recruitment campaign this time. Yeah, it does. Um, you know, and, and it's 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 just getting out there and, and getting that footprint. We did a leaflet drop and all sorts of things. So it's just being innovative in, in how we can get that, that message across, really. Um, so we talked about single online homes. So again, we're just trying to promote that. We're putting it on uh, the front end on the website and also on the 101 uh, call so that it encourages people. Also, if you are then put into a queue for 101, it will remind you every every minute that you can, did you know that you can apply a uh, report online? So hopefully that will start to um, improve things with, you know, because we need to start, because a lot of things can be done through the online service. And I think the key message to the public at the moment, Commissioner, is that, and, and what Fiona means there is when someone rings one of them, there will be a, a verbal message on there um, uh, asking people if it's appropriate to go down the single online home room. As I'll get to on the performance pack, the the the, um, the answer time for 101s has increased because we're focusing on 999s. So there is a real uh, a chance that if you're ringing 101, you are going to spend longer waiting, and which we're trying to reduce that time. But there there are there is the single online home method if it's for crime reporting that we can get people to go down and accurately put the details in there, and we'll try and pr process it that way. Because not everybody wants to be waiting on the phone for a considerable amount of time, which is why we're putting messages on to try and divert people. We still want to speak to them. We still want the information, absolutely. But it might be more applicable and easier for them to then go online and do it that way. Yeah, I think that um, maybe this is maybe we need to talk in the performance pack about this. But um, I know that certainly I've had a question from a parish councillor who I'm going to visit this afternoon, and um, they're talking about ringing 101 when an actual crime is happening. And I think that there is quite a lot of confusion as to. When do you ring a 999 and when do you ring 101? And I think we need to get that out there, a bit of an explanation, but um, we can talk another time about that. But just picking up on something you said about a single online home, that's fine for residents to report on there and to direct them to there. However, you're telling me at the same time, though, it's quite, you know, it's slower to be actioned. So that's my concern there. Uh, just to put some reassurance behind that, Commissioner, the, the single online home really does direct you that if it is something that hasn't got an element of threat and risk to it, um, then it will direct you back to us through the telephone line. So um, just please be reassured that it, we are really looking at that lower okay. lower level for that. Thank you. Um, we're looking at reviewing our processes and procedures. So I touched on it lightly earlier. We have a lot of question sets that our control room operators need to go through that have been embedded over time for certain things, whether it's to meet our, um, you know, criminal CDI sort of rate. So looking at what do we need to make sure we have met in terms of our crime detection. Um, Thrive has been introduced, which is a really good tool. So that's looking at threat, harm, risk, engagement, where that person is vulnerable, um, and some of the questions have taken us away from having the ability to really thrive those incidents. So work's ongoing at the moment to look at that so we can start to reduce not the quality of that call, but the time that we're on that call so that we can A, get people to them quicker, and then also reduce the time that somebody is maybe on an after call, so carrying out all of the various checks and things. Because whilst they're doing that, they're not able to then answer the next call. So work's ongoing to actually review all those processes and bits and pieces. And that's consultation with other heads of departments as well, because they've been created over time, really. Um, and then the introduction of our um, initial investigation team. So that came into place in, I think it was beginning of June. Um, and, you know, 
it's working really, really well. We need to really get some communications out with that. Um, they're taking approximately 30 to 50% of incidents through an appointment system. Um, so within three days, someone will have had contact with police in terms of, um, and again, we're talking at the lower end, there's not any high risk or threat within those appointments, um, but it has reduced the demand on the front line you know, immensely because what we need our front line to be doing is getting to those immediates and those priority uh, grades. So it is working well. We are due to have a benefits review uh, just to see how it is going. We do know that there are things that we need to look at and change. Um, but overall, um, it is doing what it said on the tin. Um, we just need to get it a little bit more streamlined and uh, working so that it benefits everybody on that wider piece. But it's again, it's another method for people to be able to get in touch with the police service. Yeah. Um, just on that, Commissioner, we have um, we have a um, survey for people that deal with the IET. So like a customer satisfaction survey that we've set up and um, we've got a 93% um, very pleased satisfaction rate. So um, that's working well. If, that, if I could introduce that in the false control room, it'd be good so we can see how, how the public are viewing us for that. But so we know it's working in IET, so it's something that we can maybe take forward into the control room as well. Yeah, and just to say, Fiona, I completely agree with you from what I've seen. Um, the IET, it's, it's great. It really is. And of course, with new initiatives, it takes time to bed in. But um, yeah, absolutely. I'm not surprised you've got those satisfaction rates there. Jenny, can I bring that bring you in? I was just going to say it's really good to hear that that um, excellent level of kind of customer satisfaction has been maintained as the IET has been developed, Fiona. And I would love to see it. Um, mapped across to the world of uh, or the wider world of FCR. I think the OPFCC would be fully behind that if we can help to make that a reality. Brilliant. I'll still write that down. Thank you. <laughs> OK, um, so just going on then. So we talked so 999 calls. Um, so the two minute waiting time was reduced from 5% to 1.54. These are national figures, by the way. Uh, so from March, we have seen a, a reduction for calls waiting um, and the in answer time has improved average in 10 seconds. And I do take your point, Commissioner, about an average rather than the, the actual day to day. But we are working on, on that lifetime. Um, the reason that we have seen a, an improvement is due to the, the, the things we put in place in November. So specifically that dedicated um, people to answer those nines, which we've seen as work. So we need to now just replicate that for the 101s um, to try and get that time down for us. Because uh, as you can see, the average answer there is seven minutes, but we know in reality it's a lot longer than that for some people, which we do need to work on. So, yeah, Commissioner, the sustainability just in terms of, so for, for November, for example, we know we're, at, we're, um, we're already uh, answering in, on average uh, 12 seconds and 74% of all 999s are answered in under 10 seconds, which is um, which is a vast improvement of, of where mm. we've been. So in terms of sustainability, to, to explain it, if you've got 20 call handlers in there dealing with all 999s and 101s, what we often do is multi-skill them to take either a 9 or a 101. So whatever comes through to their headset, it, it, they will take it. What we've done now is dedicate a, a decent proportion of those 20 to just be available and ready to take 999s but they're not available to take 101s. So we are prioritising those 999s. This is something, even as the ACC, that I'm having daily conversations around because I still have the concern that there are people who need us also on 101s. Uh, OK, it might not be something that's happening now, but it's an exceptionally serious offence that they've been brave enough to ring up and report. We don't want those people abandoning those calls because we know that we have a, a relatively high abandonment rate um, for 101 calls. So we need a method in terms of where we can screen who's on those 101s. And um, that isn't something we can do overnight. So what Fiona's done is to ensure that we do get the balance right, you know, because even if we could be answering 999 calls in one second or 100% of the time. But if you're waiting on 101 for 30 minutes on average, that's absolutely not acceptable. So we've got to get the balance. So that's what Fiona and the team have been doing with questions from me every day. If I, I understand you're hitting the target in terms of 999s, we might be missing the point in terms of the importance of people waiting on 101. So to give you that reassurance, it isn't just a case of skilling everybody to nines and leaving 101s by the wayside. We are not doing that. So Fiona's looking now at a way of prioritising then 
those 101 calls because you'll see a fluctuation in the average answer time for 101s and it's definitely gone up this month significantly. Um, so that's something that we're really focusing on. But I wanted to try and give you some reassurance there. Yeah, well, you, you know, you know how focused I am because obviously I'm here to, you know, be the voice of the public. And they say to me all the time, they really struggle to get through on 101. And I know that you're doing some great work. Don't get me wrong. And we're going in the right way. But there's still an awful lot more to do. But I can see how focused you all are as well, which is just fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've talked about recruitment intention already. The Op Baker, Op Baker was brought in um, just before the summer, and this was to look at the uh, demand in our inboxes. So we have a number of email boxes as well, where we get various inquiries. Uh, so we've got general inquiries, we've got the force control rooms, so and that might be other forces uh, sending emails in. So all these are other methods where people are contacting us that, that, that need addressing. But again, there shouldn't be anything in there that is of high demand, but it needs that scanning and oversight to check that there isn't something that's gone in there. Um, so we were looking at. Oh, I've just lost you, Fiona. Can you still hear us? I can hear you. I think I just can't hear Fiona. Oh, I can Commissioner, now. can you hear me? I can hear you. Fiona, I think you Apologies, come back. Apologies, we've just had a technical issue where all the IT's just gone off. If you can just bear oh, with us, okay. two minutes, please. Apologies. Hello. We can hear you, Fiona. Thank you. Ah, we're just uh, we're just putting headsets on, <laughs> just so we don't get feedback. Um, there's a bit of a storm, so I think that might have uh, triggered the TV to go off. So apologies. Yeah. Okay, I think Mike's nearly on now. Um, so Op Baker was brought in. That was predominantly looking at overtime um, and people to monitor the the uh, the inboxes um, and and those not those return calls to members of the public um we we have reduced that now um we are a, a place that we are being able to manage that um, there's the odd occasion that we might have to call somebody in just due to staffing or sickness um resulting in that but um that has helped us again try and get the focus on the main room um and as i said the general inquiries inbox has moved across to our front counter staff now so they're monitoring that um through their their workload um and through that work in terms of the process and procedure, we're also looking at how can we best uh, monitor those uh, non-demanding high risk, uh, low risk, um, whilst not taking the focus off the one-on-ones really. Um, so that's that's part of that. But Op Baker did work well for us over the summer when we had that high demand. Um, ACC Walker touched on the VSA, so that is our victim satisfaction. So, uh, again, through HMIC, really, really pleased with the Thrive assessments um, that we are applying to incidents, um, the good um, supervisory oversight, and also the, I think it goes without mentioning, the comm staff, uh, the courteousness, the empathy, and the politeness that they're actually uh, giving to the members of the public when they're phoning up was was particularly mentioned. So I think that is, you know, really key to sort of show the credit to to the people that are actually in there and, like you say, under demanded situations and 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 still maintaining that professionalism when they're on the phone, um, and obviously not applying any sort of bias or, um, you know, dealing with people without favour. So that's really really positive for us, and we need to continue that and not dilute that through the work that we're doing. And they touched on the customer satisfaction through IET. I, I did a misjustice. I said 93% is 94. So we'll take that one as a win. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if this is working now. Oh, there we go. Um, I just put this one in, Commissioner, because again, because front counters do come under sort of my department and I wanted to highlight the work that they actually do on behalf of um, customer contact. Um, so that just gives you an overview of, of the, the tiers and, and what we have available to the members of the public um, and when they can actually call in uh, in person, which, you know, we, we know that members of the public do still want to come into police stations. So we do have that ability. Um, they've got a total of 39 uh, FTE um and we're currently got um 
6.53 vacancies. Again, we've been out to recruitment and we've just finished a course actually. Uh, so they are now within their stations um, and there'll be further recruitment um, ongoing just to fill those future vacancies if they're out now. Um, but they take 8,000 operator calls a month, which I think you know can't be underestimated the amount of demand again because they're dealing with members of the public face to face and also those operator calls we are looking at what those operator calls are so again linking into are they are they right for coming into the police service or are there other agencies that we can look to divert those so there is work ongoing again to look at that workload but again it's just a thank you to the to the front counter staff for for that demand and they do deal with some of the single online home as well, 999s and 101. Uh, Fiona, can we? Can I just ask a question about your vacancies again then? Mm. So you've got nine posts at the moment you've got to fill. Are they spread across all the front counter areas or is there a particular place that is, that is quite low? Um, the other thing is, when did you say that have we recruited the nine posts or are we going back out to recruitment? When do you expect them to be in post and how long does it take to train them up? Quite so, a few questions there. Sorry. There is, yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping I've got the answers to some of them. So the nine posts, um, so we've got, I think there's two at North Allerton. Uh, one is um, over at Harrogate and there's a couple at Scarborough. So it's, it's not just one one place. It is, it is spread across the, um, the county. Um, the course, um, I believe, and I will get the correct information for it, I believe it's about eight weeks for the course because obviously when you're looking at dispatch and comms, it's quite bespoke. The front counters yeah. deal with <laughs> a whole host of yeah. things. So, it, again, it's quite a long course for them to do. And then, you know, as we know, with some of the stations, if you look on here, you know, Richmond, once you've done your course, you could be out there on your own and you haven't got that peer-to-peer -peer support uh, next to you. So um, we need to make sure that we've got that mentor for them as well once they do go out. Um, the adverts are actually live at the moment, so it'll be the new year by the time we get new people back in uh, and on another course. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, some of the challenges then is the retention of staff and through the sort of exit interviews um, involving the staff. Um, we've talked about tenure. We've got a meeting about that tomorrow to see whether that is um, optional. Um, I have spoke to some of the staff actually in the control room and they would favour it, um, particularly when they're monitoring the new people when they come out onto the floor uh, and then they see them disappear within you know 11 months because they do have a nine month probationary period that they have to complete so if they're going for an internal job they have to complete the probation period before they can apply but that is the only um, caveat on on anyone that comes into the organization um, we know that the surrounding forces for us are paying uh, average seven percent more than our control room um, there's been an increase in demand nationally in terms of calls. Um, we need to reduce the after call. So that's what we talked about in, in terms of, because we reduce that, then we'll get more calls answered. And that includes looking at the call script questions. Um, we are starting to get some really good data quality. If, if one thing the control has is it's data rich, um, we just need to get that in a, in a format that we can really drill down into. And, and like you say, lifetime so that we can really be bespoke with where our demand is and, and, and where we need to put our people at the most important times. And then we started the introduction and implementation of Right Person, Right Care, which is being uh, led by um, Superintendent Haywood Noble in our partnership hub. So we're working closely with um, with him. Um, that that's start to look to reduce some of the demand, certainly for our third party reporting. So mm -hmm. things like hospitals, if somebody a patient's, you know, maybe walked out with a cannula and, you know, it's who's the right person to deliver the right care to that person. So that is ongoing at the moment with a health care's due to go live in January, I believe. Um, so that should start soon. We need to build the confidence up within our staff, um, you know, to have those conversations in a in a polite and a professional manner as well. So a few challenges. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, Commissioner, I'll just come in on the uh, right care, right person. You've obviously had um, a, a previous briefing in relation to it. I, I see this as one of the biggest opportunities that certainly not just North Yorkshire Police, but I think police nationally, because Humberside uh, being one of the, uh, the initial force to roll this out, have seen significant reductions in demand for police, which is that's not the whole reason for it. It's the right care 
for the right person. It's not around just diverting that, uh, that, that demand from the police. Yes, the police have taken on extra demand that they shouldn't be dealing with, but there's some significant improvements, for, for example, reducing 80% down to 30% in terms of uh, attending particular incidents, concerns for safety, which is the best care for that person as opposed to a police officer arriving. What it will need, though, is some intense work within the force control room, floor walkers, for example, because we know the, the communication staff do an excellent job, but sometimes they need the confidence to be able to say no. It's very, very difficult to do when they've got the care and compassion and want to apply help to be able to, to actually say no, we're not coming. It's very difficult. What we need to make, make sure is that we have those partnership relationships so that that person still is getting care. It's not just the police saying no, and putting the phone down. That's not what it's about. So it's around working with those partners, but we need floor walkers within the control room to give those communication staff, those call handlers, the confidence to be able to embed this strategy. But I do honestly think it's one of the best opportunities that we've had that we're going to have on the back of initially thrive and things like the uh, initial inquiry team to deal with demand at source this is a really really important one yeah i'd like to just say that i completely agree with you but i think it's important right now for any of the you know members of the public that are watching this to understand can you give an example of where that could happen because you're right we're not going to just put the phone down and, and say no we're not coming so can you just put a bit more meat on the bones there mike for anybody who's listening in yeah, Fiona's yeah. going to come back in, sorry. So it's more for the third party, so things like hospitals and things. So, you know, we've we've had incidents where people have walked out with um, a, a cannula still attached, for example, and they've asked uh, the police to go and do a, a welfare check. And it, and it's it's looking at who's the right person. So is there a family member nearby or is there a district nurse that they could maybe deploy uh, to, to go and do it? Because police are not medically trained to remove cannulas at the best which would then result in us taking them to hospital we've had um, mental health ring up and ask us to come and remove somebody from their facility who's been discharged you know that that's not going to help that individual um, and, and we wouldn't be wanting to put hands on anybody that's in a in a in a mental need or you know place of, of, of insecurity and the police aren't the best placed and it's it's looking at how we negotiate that so it's not necessarily the, the public it's more our partners that we need to be working better with um and getting that understanding so there's been workshops that you've attended haven't you? Has. And, and i've briefed them um, uh, initially um it's healthcare partners um, who really fully understand why we are doing it um we will then go on to brief social care partners um it's examples like asking us ringing up and saying somebody hasn't attended an appointment uh, and it'll be mental health related and can we go and check on them um, uh, you know, on those occasions, no, we will ass a threat assess it. And if they've made threats to harm themselves, absolutely, we'll be going to it. But I think we've got into uh, used to actually just responding to uh, and working very closely with these partners and picking up some of the demand that uh, mm -hmm. can be dealt with better elsewhere, really. So, but yeah, initially healthcare partners and focused because we're using data. We're not just, it's not a broad brush across all healthcare partners. The ones that are causing significant demand that's not appropriate we are saying that that needs to change and it will change on the 31st of January but you know to reassure the public it's it's absolutely the police will still attend if there's a level of uh, threat and risk there but partners will also need to attend um, but it's um, it, it's it's a staged approach starting on the 31st of January but all relevant partners are engaged in that. Yeah and I know at Humberside it works extremely well it really does. Um, Jenny can I bring you in please and then Mabs. Yeah, it, it's just to pick up on some of the points that both um, Mike and Fiona have made and yourself, so in, in terms of the implementation of this and making sure that we've got some checks and balances um, around not only that it's having the impact for the force that's desired, but it's also having the impact that's desired for the individuals involved so that we actually do know that they are getting the right care for the right person. And I'm just really interested to understand uh, as to whether you feel like you've got those measures in place currently, or are you still working on those, uh, and how will you do that with partners? Yeah, so a really, really good point, Jenny. So I'm content 
we, that we are following the model, for example, that Humberside have, have developed. Um, uh, luckily, um, uh, the uh, the Deputy Chief Constable at Humberside has agreed uh, to give us some peer support in relation to how we've dealt with it, so we're not doing it on our own. Um, uh, they've already given us some advice in terms of the floor walkers in the control room being the key point. So we're going to work with Humberside really closely to make sure that, one, we learn from some of the mistakes they may have made with this, and that's certainly what Ed's doing already. We find that when we introduce Thrive here as one of the first forces in the country to do it, every force nationally now does it. Well, everyone's learned from the mistakes that we made back in 2014 and have developed it and built upon it. I think right care, right person is something similar. So I think that peer support from Humberside is really important and it's something that I welcome. Thanks, Mike. Mabs, did you want to come in or have you put your hand Yeah, around? just to give uh, uh, Mike and Fee a little bit of a break. So it's around the organisational context of this in terms of statutory responsibilities. So the right care, right person is about organisations and corporate bodies and private sector discharg discharging their corporate and statutory responsibilities. So if you look at some of the examples of where we've been called, you know, we, we've had calls from hospitals because somebody's refusing to leave the, the, the lobby of a hospital. Yeah. And for us to attend as an emergency service is not the appropriate resource to then force them out of that building to take them home. Clearly, there's a reason why the person's refusing to leave a mental health establishment because they don't feel ready to leave. So it needs some wider care from that establishment itself. They're not causing a breach of a peace. There's no threat to anybody else or them as individuals. Calling us isn't the appropriate thing to do. So what the work that Mike has alluded to that we've done with partners in the partnership day is outlining these type of examples, the, the thousands and thousands of cause of concerns calls we get that our officers are having to deal with, that they haven't got the mental health and, and other training required in order to deal with them. And it's causing us a significant demand, which we then can't focus on those in need. And that's where we need to apply our focus. The, the forces which have taken this you know, Hampshire and, and Humberside being two, I've seen some significant improvements. So the measures that we'll have in place will still exist through the customer contact and through the firms that we have reviewing the logs because we've got a responsibility to do that. But what we will be doing is being much more robust in pushing back against 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 it with some partners to say that this is not our responsibility to attend. Thank you. I can't see hands up because I've got a different screen, but am I all right to go? Yeah, you are. Please go ahead. So looking at opportunities, um, so I talked about workforce management tool, which is something that we want to try and explore because that will help us uh, really understand where our key demand is, where we need to have people within the room, what we need them to be doing, whether that's nines, one or ones. And then that will really help us to bespoke what our recruitment campaigns are like, what we need to specifically recruit towards, and then obviously managing uh, people within that room, whether it's flexi plans, whether it's uh, shift patterns, et cetera. But that tool will really help us understand that. And that's kind of what we're wanting to, to work towards on that, really. Look at increasing the staffing in the comms and dispatch. So ten, we're hoping that we'll be there by uh, January and we've got really positive um, campaign out at the moment. So once we get up to that that number, we should start to see a real improvement on those calls, not just the nines, but also the 101s. Um, being aspirational, it'd be lovely to look at a Digidesk, which looks at live chats social media so again this is going back to how we're going to start to offer different methods of um, communication from the public because um, we know that people like to communicate in many many different ways and we know that it's been successful in other forces um, obviously we've got single online home at the moment so that's what we're going to exploit uh, at this time uh, with an aspiration of working towards something like the digital desk um, moving forward um, potential for a switchboard again we've we've been there in the past uh, we know it works elsewhere and this this acts as a really good triage um, so again that you you will massively reduce the number of people waiting on 101 and we'll be able to divert them to the right people at the, you know for the right departments and also be able to get to those calls um, quicker but again that's that's work that we're exploring uh, at the moment to see what the advantages are of that. Uh, again, uh, Mr Walker alluded to it, working with Umberside through their um, experience as to how that works and what, what difference it's made for their force. Look at performance monitoring and the after call 
uh, right person, right coach we've talked upon, and then obviously the benefits review um, of the IET um, and what we're sort of working towards at the moment. I can't see any hands up. Sorry if there's any questions on that one. No, carry on, please. OK, thank you. So we're looking at completion of the initial uh, rapid scoping work. So that takes into account all of the stuff that we've talked about previously. Um, looking at the recruitment um, to get that up and running, reduction in wrap up time, um, targeted to campaign to ensure comms officers correctly recording their status. So this goes back to the the skilling um, software that I talked about because uh, we, again, this involves one to ones with staff to make sure they fully understand that if they're sat in an after call, but actually they're they're ready what impact that has and how it makes you what, what we actually need to be in that room. So really quite robust on on making sure that those those right selections are, are on there. So if they're on a break, they're on a break, but not showing an after call. So a little bit of management uh, within the room on, on what that looks like, because that will um, impact on, on what our demand looks like and where we need people. Uh, workforce management tool, which I've already touched on, and the greater use of single online home and We've also identified uh, through our force incident managers, we've given um, certain portfolios to those officers. Um, so one person is linked to right person, right care, working closely with the partnership hub. And also then they will be our expert within the room to be able to help us really deliver that um, and obviously encourage the floor walkers that, that we want to bring in once we go live, just to build that confidence. And there's a number of different um, areas that our force incident managers are now covering. Um, to help us sort of drive some of the, the performance through. Um, in terms of results, obviously at the moment, we're very much in that um, early stage. Um, so we haven't got a full review and full benefits for you at the moment, but hopefully you can see with some of the work that I've outlined today, uh, what we're trying to drive forward. Um, we'll start to see some of those results that we want ultimately to provide that better service to the public so that when they're ringing 101, they're getting that answer uh, in two minutes against our SLA 80% of the time. Um, you know, so we, we have got a lot of work to do. Um, we know that, but I can say that everybody in that room is absolutely dedicated and wants to do the best that they can for the public. Um, and so hopefully through everything that we've explained today, um, we will start to really see those improvements. And when we get that course in in January, um, we'll, we'll start to see that. Can't see anybody. Fiona, can I ask a question about um, under the aims? You know, yes. you're, pl you're planning to get up to your 95 complement in the force control rooms, in, in the force control room. Um, now that 95, was that 95, did you have 95 pre-COVID or have you increased the amount of people coming into the force control room because our um, calls coming in have just gone up through the roof, haven't they? So the amount of calls. So is that, have we, I'm basically asking, do we have enough at 95? So the nine, the eight, so the eight six plus the ten percent to the ninety five. So that is what we had pre COVID. Mm -hmm. Obviously, what we have seen is that we have got a higher demand. Um, we, you know, demand analysis does say that we do need more people, um, but I think it's fair to say that we do need to look at some of our processes and procedures to actually see what that true demand looks like before we look at what improvements we need on people in in that room. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think oh, a little bit more there. I think I've probably covered everything that's in there. <laughs> Just look at obviously 999s uh, offering other options to the public. Shift patterns potentially, again, linked to the workforce management tool. Uh, it's going to be a continuous recruitment drive because I've already touched on that, you know, we do get an attrition rate. Um, so we've always got to maintain that that recruitment keeping in touch with people and really promoting ourselves um, and, and, and becoming a place that people actually want to come work with us, be engaged uh, and, and actually enjoy coming to work and providing that service to people. Mabs, can I, sorry, sorry Mabs, can I bring you in? Put your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. It's just in relation to the previous question we asked around the numbers. The 95 allows us to keep the wheels on the bus. As I say, that's what it is. It's not about improving service. It's about trying to get uh, maintain where we think we need to be at this moment in time. 
some demand modelling has taken place and there's work undergoing in the background. The reality is, if you look at the forces that are doing this really well and are providing a really good service for those calling in an emergency on the nines and the one no ones and managing a customer contact function effectively in the organisation, they have much larger numbers. For example, Humberside have close to 150. So I'm not saying that we need 150, but certainly 95 will not may help us achieve that. So there's some further conversations, some modelling has taken place, and we will be in further discussions with yourself in relation to as to what the future operating model for customer contact looks like, because that is the operational heart of the organisation where everything comes in. Yeah, and I know you are doing a lot of work in, in that respect there, so thank you. Right, well, thank you. My presentation, thank you. Oh, thanks, Fiona, and thank you, Mike, and Mabs, too, for that. Um, we can see that there is a lot of work being done. We've got a very long way to go, though, and, you know, my focus will carry on on this. Um, and also, just before we came on air, I did say to Mike, I would like to come into the control room and, and work from there so I can see it for myself again um, to see and say hello to the staff that are working extremely hard. They really are to, to, give, a, a, to give this service. OK, thank you very much. Right. Let's go on to agenda item five, and that's the performance update. And Mike, we're back to you. Thank you. Excellent. OK. I'll check on Fiona's screen that you can see that. Great mm -hmm. stuff. Right. Uh, so, yes, thank you. Well, what we'll do is we'll go through uh, the performance pack and, and, and focus on some on some key areas. The first couple of slides are strange enough around uh, emergency calls, so 999 calls and 101s, which we've already spoken about. Um, but just on that on that first slide, um, at the bottom, you've got your average speed uh, of answer. And for October this year, that's been 19 seconds. L last month when I was here, um, it was it was an improvement. It was 15 seconds. And, and, and this month it's been 19, 19 seconds. Um, the, the target is to answer uh, 90% of 999 calls in under 10 seconds. That's the national target. Um, and where we are currently, we answer approximately about 50 to 51% of our 999 calls in under 10 seconds. Now, uh, the rest of that 50% is 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 split of uh, just over 10 seconds and, and any time up to that. The, 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 we do not have incredibly long wait times. We know we have some that go over two minutes nationally uh, and some in North Yorkshire that go uh, over two minutes. That's not an acceptable number. When I speak to colleagues over in Humberside, their aim is to have zero uh, over two minutes. And that absolutely needs to be North Yorkshire's aim as well, which, which goes on to some of the discussions we've already had around uh, the requirement for extra extra people in there as well as looking at the process. The one positive I can give is, and you obviously, as I've described already, we've changed the way that we are prioritising answering 999 calls and 101s. So in November so far, and we're nearly obviously at the end of, uh, of November, we are answering on average uh, a 999 call in 12 seconds, which is a significant improvement, not just on October, but for this year. We, you know, we've been around the 20 seconds and we are the second uh, uh, poorest performing force nationally in relation to that average speed of answer that you see at the bottom right of your screen. But really importantly as well is that in November so far, it's 72% of those 999 calls that we've answered in under 10 seconds, which is, you know, is a 21% increase. Now, um, we'll be able to talk about that in at the end of um, uh, December when we look at the stats for November, but it's something that we're looking at on, on a daily basis uh, to make sure that, one, we manage that, the risk between the 999s and 101s, and we're not just solely focusing on getting below that 10-second number, uh, because when I move on to the next slide in a second, you'll see that the demand increases that it's had um, on the 101s. So in terms of then the next slide, non-emergency calls, so these are the 101 um, calls. Uh, the, the service level agreement there is to answer 80% of those calls in under two minutes. Now you can see that the 36-month average is about four and a half minutes, but for October, 
that's essentially doubled, hasn't it, uh, to around nine minutes. Um, now, we did predict that, that would be the case, um, that we would see people waiting a lot longer on 101s. And Fiona and I have had that discussion today because it's around three and a half weeks that we've been doing this, is to make sure that we now focus on getting that balance right, as I mentioned earlier. We've got to make sure we reduce that 101 handling call time, um, not to the detriment of 999s, but we need to get that balance right because as I've said there are a lot of important calls and members of the public that we need to speak to waiting um, on 101s um, so you know that that's some of the issues that we've been uh, we've been having but it is the message to the public is we have been prioritizing the 999s um, but we still are prioritizing the answer of 101s and, and the aim is to get that um, uh, uh, call waiting time down significantly. Can you tell me what is the longest time somebody's had to wait on a 101 to have answered their call in October, please? Because this is an average. Yeah, you know? I haven't. You no, know, I haven't, uh, Commissioner, got the exact uh, longest wait. We, we've we looked at, so on a daily basis, we look at that from a chief officer uh, uh, team. And I know there, are, there have been people waiting uh, between half an hour and an hour uh, on 101 on some days it's just it's 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 not acceptable and this yeah. is why we have an abandonment rate of 20 yeah. percent we shouldn't be having more than five percent abandonment uh, on 101s and another thing that we are doing again um uh, is working uh, uh, Humberside police have agreed to come and do a peer review uh, with ourselves to help us with the call handling times, to help us with the processes within the control room, um, how we look at the supervision, um, how the room's set up, um, and looking at some of the technology in there. Um, that's something that they will do. Uh, uh, you know, te you know, in, in, ten years ago in 2012, we were graded as outstanding in our control room from a HMIC point of view, and we had from forces nationally uh, coming across to see how we'd achieve that. Um, so. You know, we we know how we need to achieve that. It's just a question of now is putting the right plans in place, having the relevant discussions, uh, and then over the next uh, uh, 12 months um, is making sure that we get back to where we need to be uh, serving the public of North Yorkshire with an outstanding control room. That needs to be the aim. Mm. Well, I would say a lot quicker than 12 months, but I know these things take time, but you know my opinion on that. But thanks, Mike. Absolutely. So the next slide is around uh, policing uh, response. So lots of colourful figures and bar charts, as you can see at the top. So we'll just focus here, though, on the immediate urban, rural and priority um, uh, um, attendance. So this is essentially once the call comes into the control room to the dispatcher um, is how long it's taken us to actually attend at, uh, at the scene. So we know with immediate urban, the, the priority is, is under 15 minutes to get there. For an immediate rural, it's under 20 minutes. And for a priority incident, we should be getting there uh, in under 60 uh, under 60 minutes. So average time wise, we're doing OK. All right. And what we've been looking at as a force is the average. Uh, and we're actually uh, the vast majority of the time hitting the target. However, when we drill down into that, in terms of immediate urban, we actually only get to 62% um, of them uh, in under 15 minutes. We only get to 58% uh, of immediate rurals in under 20 minutes, and we only get to 66 Point nine. let's round it up, 67% of priority grades in under an hour. So that's what we're going to be focusing on um, from a frontline point of view, from the supervision all the way up, to make sure that we're not just looking at the average, that we're actually looking at the uh, percentage of uh, how many we've got to in that time. But in terms of compliance, so the, 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 the compliance to those percentages would rise actually by 20% if you add three minutes to the INP target time. So instead of uh, 15, 20 and 60, if you added three minutes to each of them, um, then actually the compliance. So for example, if you added 3% to immediate urban or three minutes to immediate urban, that would go up to 82%. Now that just shows the fine margins that we're dealing with. Um, we are, Yes, we may not be getting there in 15 minutes, but it's not taking an incredible amount longer to actually get there. Um, so that's what we need to be drilling down to is the actual length of time it's taken to get to specific incidents. And that's what individual super advisors will actually be looking at moving forward. Mabs, can I bring you in? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Mike's touched upon a majority of the points that I know he's going to come on to the, the issue of a PDU. But there has been a, a lack of focus on this area because we have been looking at average times. What we need to do is focus on the actual time attendance in each of the areas. Um, sergeants and inspectors are now becoming focused on this. The conversations are taking place through the Chief Inspector Ops 
it is featuring in our performance reviews through the force performance meeting, the quarterly performance meeting, uh, which actually is now monthly for the commands and quarterly for the other departments. And the reason it's monthly for the commands is because of the areas of focus that we have on performance at this moment in time until we get to a stable position. So we will see improvements and what will help is what Mike will touch upon now is the, some of the decisions we've made around our uh, development, professional development units that we've had in the force and where student officers were originally doing their training, etc. But through Mike and the teams and the commanders, we will start seeing the, the improvements that need to be made, which will then support. It's okay answering the call quick enough, but soon when we answer the call, we need a resource to be able to attend. And only attending, you know, at times 50 and 55% in 15 minutes or in an hour is just not good enough for us as an organisation. But we are focused on improving it. Yeah, I think... It It'd be really good to have like a national benchmark or at least a comparable force, you know, to us that we could see it to to compare. Well, I know that's quite tricky. I know it, it, is. it is. It is, Commissioner. But what I could say to you is um, similar forces in terms of geography. Most forces will be hitting the 80, 85 percent plus on the emergencies because that's why it's called an emergency. That, you know, if somebody rings us and it's a 999 call, that we want uh, Fee and her team to answer the call as quickly as possible. But once Fee answers the call, what we can't be doing is what sometimes happens in, in forces, and it happens here, is we're shouting up for a unit and there's nobody there. Yeah. That's respond, and there is the focus. Uh, for example, I know the city command have had an SMT day yesterday where the inspectors with a new commander have gone through exactly this as to what their responsibilities are for an inspector. And for some, it came as a little bit of a surprise, but they weren't aware that they had to do it in 15 minutes and some didn't know they had to do it in, in, in 20. For, so the focus is coming in through the performance framework that we've established, mm -hmm. the CPD sessions are taking place. But I'll, I'll let Mike uh, touch upon uh, the professional development unit, the decisions and how that's going to assist. Because one of the issues has been, which is an organisational issue rather than the local command issue, is that we've just haven't put the people in the right place to go answer the call. So they have struggled on the local commands, but the decision we've made recently is going to help with that. I'll pass it back to Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. Um, so yes, Commissioner, um, clearly uh, there are um, uh, significant numbers of vacancies across response officers across the force. However, those uh, those vacancies, I guess, are, are covered. So we have the officer numbers, uh, but they are actually uh, student officers. So student officers who are either in their first 20 weeks training, uh, either in tutorship or then uh, uh, going to various different attachments. So the way we've set up the police constable degree apprenticeship, so the new way to become a police officer, it's a three year probation. Year one is essentially set, uh, spent in a, an awful lot of training and tutorship. And in year two, what we decided upon uh, probably actually two years ago is uh, 10 months of that two years that we're going to spend on attachments. So largely a good length of time on a crime attachment, uh, neighbourhood policing attachment, another response attachment, and then a roads policing attachment. And that was to enable those students to uh, gain their occupational competency portfolio. So to be able to get signed off. The decision we've made uh, over recent weeks and been very quickly able to uh, uh, make some traction on is to reduce those year two attachments and secondments uh, down to attend, uh, essentially two months worth uh, of a crime attachment. So we've cut eight months worth there. What that's allowed us to do is drop numbers straight away, student officers back onto response bands. So take them from the attachments and put them onto response bands. It's as simple as that. Um, that has shown, so for example, will be an extra 151 response officers across the force, which is a lot, um, uh, just in January. And we've already dropped uh, around 80 to 90 uh, uh, numbers wise, taking them from attachments or stopped them going to the attachments and they're staying on or going back to response onto the different bands. Um, that will incrementally go up uh, over the next 12 months. Um, and we should start to see uh, some of the performance improvements we expect to see. Caveat on that is a lot of these are student officers and maybe haven't had a driving course yet, which is crucial um, uh, for North Yorkshire Police. So they might not be qualified to do blue light response. They can still drive A to B and go to appointments, which is which is great. And we're making sure that we, um, you know, if you look at nationally, I think the average length of service for um, an officer on a response shift is less than three years. Uh, and it's been going down year on year on year. 
uh, we want to make sure we've still got experience um, uh, in those areas as well. Um, so that's what it's allowed us to do is to put more student officers, response officers, but new, they, they are new and, and less experienced onto those response bands to try and improve and increase those percentages uh, of the tendency uh, to I, I, I rural, I urban um, uh, and priority grade incidents. Jenny, can I bring you in? Can I ask, Mike, when you expect that the things that you're putting in place to see an impact, when do you expect to see a change in those? Yeah, may I just come in on that? Uh, Jenny, it's going to be incremental because the numbers are coming out in, in a phased approach. So what we can't say is, look, by you know January, for example, there'll be over 100 uh, student officers and everything's going to be fine because clearly some of them can't drive, some of them have got different levels of experience. But already we're starting to see some impact. So, for example, the work that Mike has been leading on with a professional development unit and um, Lee Partridge, Partridge um, the inspector in there, has been absolutely, you know, they've turned this around very, very quickly, as, as in particular Inspector Lee Partridge. And City, for example, their resourcing numbers now on response are back to what they were in 2019. County is slightly different. Scarborough is there or thereabouts. Um, that was in for October's figures. Um, was it October or November figures? November. November figures, sorry. So December, there's another tranche of student officers being released. De uh, January, it's very similar. And as a, res as a result of them officers being released, Mike's now been able to release through his local policing portfolio as the assistant chief constable is a number of detectives to go into our investigation teams, which has been a huge issue. So I'll let Mike talk about that as to what the project, uh, projection is in relation to that. What we need to be very, very careful of, and I, and I need to, the reason I've come in to put a health warning on is, the impression might be that we're releasing all these officers, things will be fine. Uh, what we need to make sure is the movement in the organisation, we control that very tightly, because what I don't want, this is the worst case scenario, we've got a team of 20, but nobody can drive. Yeah. And we wonder what happened. Yeah. or they haven't got the skill set to do the method of entry or things of that nature. Um, so we are, through Mike and the team, is trying to control it very tightly. But this is a huge step forward for us because it was a gold standard allowing people to have three weeks on the roads policing team attachment. However, we can't do that whilst the organisation needs to improve the service to the public as it does. And that has to be our focus in terms of getting to the calls in the first place. They will still have attachments, but it will be days rather than weeks, as other forces do. Is there anything further, Jenny, or you just got a legacy? Well, I'm just wondering if we can press at all in terms of when we might see those figures changing. It, sorry, little... in terms of the attendance time? Well, I'm thinking about when we, yes, when we might see a difference between that 50 where it's uplifting more towards the 80. I, I, and what I would be it... like to see, as from January, we should from be seeing January. More, from January, month on month improvements. And what we should be seeing is, is actually week on week improvements and month on month improvements. But I think from January, we'll start seeing it won't go from January from 55 percent to 85 percent. But what we should what I am expecting when we're monitoring our performance as a chief officer team is continuous improvement on this, because what I've said to the commanders through a force performance meeting, I think it was yesterday, is it's difficult to hold people to account for resources they haven't got to use. But now we've given the resources for them to use then I can and legitimately hold people to account for delivery. And that's what is going to take place. So the resources have started coming out. November, December, there'll be some bedding in to do. But from January onwards, we're expecting to see week on week, month on month improvement in relation to our attendance times. That also fits in with the performance uh, meetings that are being established at a team performance level. So inspectors and sergeants will be holding their team performance meetings and they'll be having discussions with their people around and their staff around what they've been delivering against all of this. And is there, you know, am I doing more than my colleague or am I doing less? Why is, what's the reasons? Is it training? Is it welfare? Is it because I'm, I can't drive? What is that? But we'll start embedding a much more, cult, a much more stronger culture and accountability and delivery. Thanks, Mums. Perhaps I think it's important. I mean, the public will be watching this and thinking, well, is it right that we don't give our, um, you know, our new trainee officers um, like the gold star, um, you know, training that they should have? And have we looked at other forces around us and, and what, what level of training do they give there? Is Was it just us that we're giving this, this gold star training? 
Yeah, um, as you know, Commissioner, I've got experience of two of the forces before I arrived here. This is definitely Gold Star um, compared to other places. This doesn't distract or take away any of their development that they would have. Um, some of the feedback from the student officers themselves and the supervisors, you know, that were going in was actually, it's really, really nice to do, um, but it's not an essential for us to do the way we're doing it. So it's them type of things. So, yes, yeah, so we are out of kilter with what nationally was occurring. And that was also flagged up by the HMIC. Thank you. Thank you Steph. Um, so I've just moved on just to the overall crime levels here, which um, you, you can see um, that it's that, not changed a great deal um, from from last month because it's it's almost three years worth of data. But just talking about the crime side and building on from that conversation, so releasing those response officers onto those bands has has allowed us to identify um, initially eighteen. Um, uh, officers who will start their journey to, to become a detective, uh, a PIP2 um, detective and move into initially the investigation hubs and then hopefully into the crime investigation departments. And that occurs 17 of those, eight, uh, of those 18, uh, they, they, they move on the 30th of January next year. The 18th one moves uh, in, in around April. And then there's another tranche of individuals coming in later in the year, just dependent on when they finish their student officer journey. And these are people who've already highlighted that they would like to become a, a detective so we put them on what we call a detective pathway um, now that isn't to mean that I'm going to be releasing more officers from the initial ones I've dropped onto, re, onto response because it's a case of Rob Peter to pay Paul it's literally just the focus is to get the detective numbers because we know they're at really low numbers that will lower half our, um, abstract, our vacancy rate in our detectives and start to provide some uh, well needed resilience uh, within uh, within the crime investigation departments as well but just in terms of that slide, I'll move on now to the more specific ones around um, uh, burglary, uh, robbery, etc., vehicle crime and theft. So when you look at there, uh, I'll just focus there on the average uh, uh, incident uh, time to investigate a burglary at 45 days. So we're, the, the target we're looking at or we aim for is so for all victim based uh, crime to a charge decision is 44 days. Um, uh, that's what nationally is, is looked at. So we know we're around, uh, we're around that at 45 days uh, as well. The 1.89% in terms of outcomes, so that's essentially who's been charged or, or cautioned um, for a burglary uh, against the, uh, the actual number of burglary offences that we've had. So that's where that 1.89% uh, comes from. But I'll, I'll move on to the number of um, un uh, unfinalised crimes or crimes awaiting outcome, because we would expect that outcome rate to increase once we clear the backlog, which I'll talk about very shortly. Uh, they, they haven't changed very much since last month. The awaiting outcome percentages, one at 36 there for burglary and one at 52 um, for robbery as well. The, the one thing we do do now, Commissioner, on a daily basis at the force uh, daily management meeting, which is chaired by either myself, the other ACC, Elliot Foskett, um, or the DEP, Mr Hussein, we chair the daily DMM at nine o'clock every morning. And we uh, interrogate every single residential bur burglary that's happened um, or robbery that's happened and certain other offences such as domestic offences. So we get really into the weeds of what's happened in the last 24 hours and that happens seven days a week, which gives us the reassurance that we're attending every single burglary and that we're actually sending the right resource, for example, to serious sexual and rape offences as well. So we've got that real scrutiny now at chief officer level. As you can see there around violent crime as well, and your vehicle crime, you've got um, this, a very similar outcome rates uh, to, to last time. But um, when I talk around the outcome rates, we'll move on to the next slide, which is something we've already always, always um, kind of looked at, or certainly over the last few months. And you've rightfully asked questions in terms of, well, you know, why have we still got that number awaiting outcome, um, either for crimes or non-crimes. What we've what we've done is um, uh, a matter of about three or four weeks ago. A paper uh, went to the chief officer team for approval, which was around the crime occurrence, uh, crime recording and occurrence management unit, or CROMU, uh, because we were at that point around fourteen and a half thousand um, crimes awaiting outcome. 
clearly that um, uh, doesn't let us uh, actually see what our true outcome rate is for any offence, really, never mind the, the key offences that we're looking for. So a plan was put to the chief officer team around um, the fact that, one, uh, we are just finishing a course now um, for uh, a number of new recruits in the CROMU. We're going out to recruitment for, um, I think, one or two other individuals who we need to recruit to. So we should have a full uh, full-time equivalent complement now, we hope, within the next three to four months. However, in the meantime, we need to get that backlog down. Uh, so what was authorised at COT um, was a number of sergeants uh, or experienced PCs to then be trained uh, by our crime registrar to be able to start finalising and closing and, and gaining an outcome for some of those, what's actually at just over 15,000 now, um, uh, crimes awaiting outcome. They are all due to be trained on the 13th and 14th of this month. There's actually seven um, uh, uh, individuals and, and one extra. So it's all um, part, doing it part time. So it's nearly eight individuals doing it. And the plan is between January and the end of March that they get that backlog down significantly uh, with the aim of getting it down to zero. By that point, we will almost be up to full establishment in the Crime Record and Occurrence Management Unit. And the plan is that they will maintain that low number so that we can continually achieve the outcomes that we expect to see and that the public will expect to see as well. So there is a plan in place uh, and that has been a administered as we speak. Can I Any just questions on that? Yeah, yeah, well, it's actually on your previous slides. Uh, personal robbery and violent crime has gone up. Do we know, are there any trends, ex, you know, um, explanations for that? Yeah, if I can come in, Commissioner, we are due to go into greater detail around the robbery and burglaries, in particular neighbourhood crime. Uh, next month, I have a force performance meeting. We have had previously gone through this and reviewed it. I think it was only about two months ago. They are spread across the force area in terms of the street robberies. Uh, some of them are linked to multiple victims and, and young groups. Um, we haven't seen particular trends in particular areas as such or hotspots because that's all managed through the force tasking and tactical coordination group. Uh, it follows a similar trend to what is occurring nationally mm -hmm. uh, in relation to neighbourhood crime and serious violence. So when we look at our trajectory as to how we compare to the national uh, trajectory, it's very, very similar. But that's not that we're becoming complacent because next month we are going to go in much more detail around the personal robbery side because we have seen a significant increase. And our outcome rate, as Mike has alluded to there, um, we can't confidently say that's what our outcome is because there's so much sat in the queue waiting to be applied. So there is a potential we are doing ourselves a huge disservice as an organisation due to the fact that there's so much sat in the backlog. So our focus is to bring that backlog down. That'll have a twofold effect. A, it gives um, public confidence because we can say, accurately say what our outcome rates and how effectively we are putting people through the criminal justice system. And secondly, it also has a huge morale impact for our officers because they're seeing all these crimes sat on their workloads that don't need to be sat there because we're waiting to be finalised. So it, it will really help. Um, for example, I know our rape outcome rate is more in line with what the national average is. I know the national average for rape uh, isn't great, and nationally policing needs to do better, as do we, but we're not out of kilter. But if I was to show you our weekly performance report now, um, I think we'd all have coronaries because it doesn't look great, because a lot of our outcomes are sat in this queue waiting to be applied. Okay. okay. Um, will you also be looking at violent crime as well? Yep, serious violence is yeah. on our uh, force performance meeting agenda, which your office attend um, on ja in January. And there's a deep dive looking at serious violence and homicide. Um, as you know, we've got a, a, a prevention plan with regards to serious violence. On paper, we've had an increase from six homicides of the previous year to 11, uh, which is a, you know is a significant increase for us as North Yorkshire. Um, but we are having a look at all the contributing factors. We're looking at the prevention strategies that are available nationally that we can support. I know the team have already engaged the Home Office in relation to this as well. So Detective Superintendent Wayne Fox uh, is, is looking at all of this and the plan is to work through the community safety partnerships with regards to serious violence and that's where we can have the greatest impact rather than us doing something separately. Mm -hmm. But there is a much more closer focus and a deeper dive at the first performance meeting in January on serious violence. Thank it's already you. agended. Great, thank you.
just conscious of time as well, Commissioner, I'll try and uh, go through as quickly as I can. Um, some figures there, the highlights in terms of uh, 136 mental health detention. So October was higher than average incident levels uh, than, than we'd previously seen. Um, th th there's nothing uh, explaining why that is at this stage, but you can see there in terms of the transportation as well, so the demand on the police. We know that it's a continual issue uh, around us uh, transporting people, whether it's ambulances not available or being called to higher priorities as well. And, and to give you that reassurance, I am having conversations uh, from a strategic level uh, with uh, Yorkshire Ambulance Service around some of the difficulties they're facing at the moment, but they are in real difficulties in terms of their demand and weights at hospitals. Uh, so clearly the, the, there is the need at certain times for the police to step uh, in there. But, but the, 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 in terms of the mental health uh, work in the control room, that's still going to strength to strength in terms of having those uh, workers within the control room with us as well. Is there any questions on this slide? Well, it's just not only are you having conversations with uh, Yorkshire Ambulance Service, but also our mental health partners, yeah. as you know, and our health partners as well. As to, I know there are issues in A and E, and I know there are issues with, um, you know, bed blocking and that sort of thing. But it really has a ripple effect to tying up resource as well, it does. doesn't it? It does, and and strategically, I, I clearly sit on the safeguarding adults board for both York and uh, and North Yorkshire, um, and it's something that 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 is brought up there, and 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 what those uh, different. Um, partners are doing to try and address those issues uh, but also it comes up in community safety partnership meetings the strategic meetings that I sit on as well because there is a mental health link that runs through absolutely everything whether it's safeguarding adults children safeguarding or community safety so it is discussed uh, at those strategic levels as well and I know the superintendents and heads of function are discussing it at their operational meetings um, um, but I mean in terms of the Yorkshire Ambulance Service one that's something that's clearly been an issue for some time but they are hoping to put plans in place to try and address those issues but you are right it's not just the ambulance it's obviously social care mental health partners safeguarding adult partners as well because there is also about um in the section 136 suites is that the the amount of resource police resource which is tied up waiting mm. for our health partners to get those uh, staffing in place so we can hand over those very ill patients and and that is a considerable amount of time on many occasions that you know our police resource is completely tied up to yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank which you. has an adverse effect on, on our attendance time to then go to yeah. other incidents, So, which is why right care, right person is, is vitally important. Uh, just in terms of the stop search um, uh, um, slide there, we do obviously have the scrutiny panel. There is some absolute value to that scrutiny panel. I think a lot of the work that uh, has, has gone on that certainly Super, uh, Superintendent Willie has led on, certainly internally from a, a stop search point of view, uh, has faced scrutiny but has been validated and has been recognised uh, and is working. So I believe the actual scrutiny we have on stop searches is, is clearly uh, is clearly working well. Uh, I still think that we just need to understand uh, more our, our ethnicity percentage mix in terms of um, the, the stop search uh, we need to make sure we get into that data and, and and albeit it says on there that we believe it's intelligence led I think we need to check ourselves and continually check ourselves through that scrutiny process to make sure that it is intelligence led and and there isn't any disproportionality within our stop searches we cannot just rely on the fact of it's all intelligence led again we've got to dip sample and we've got to validate that ourselves mm. Can I just ask about how you use uh, the PFCC's uh, stop and search scrutiny panels? How does that affect, you know, any changes the force make? Uh, I'll come in on that, Commissioner. Um, so we, they've been running a while now, um, and so we've we've had some thematics that have come out of the scrutiny panel. So one was. Um, looking at potential disproportionality uh, in the Skipton Craven area. So uh, there was a, a real sort of uh, robust uh, actions looking at particular stop searches for that area, uh, which highlighted some concerns. So we've taken that back and looked at any particular training. Uh, was it teams? A lot of it is is training. So I'm working with a training team um, in particular. When we've looked at body one video, actually the stop and searches are really good. Uh, the feedback from the panels was uh, the officers were dealing with them with you know emotional awareness and empathy uh what we're not doing is maybe translating that as much, as well as we could do onto the mm. stop search records which clearly are where we need to record it so that is work ongoing at the moment and i'm linking in with the with your team as well just to see how we can enhance 
those review groups um, and, and make them a, a more meaningful uh, and more sort of thematic based as well. So we're, I'm working closely with Katie Wright within your team uh, to see how we can progress those and, and make them more inclusive. Um, but the teams work really well this year to increase the review groups as well. So we've got a real mix and uh, a larger number of people to, to attend and, and help scrutinise our work really. So thank you. That's good. Thank you. Thanks, Faye. So, my slide deck seems to be stuck. There we go. So, the next three slides are around the workforce, um, uh, looking at uh, police officers and PCSOs uh, especially. Uh, the, the, the first slide just gives details there in terms of the targets uh, for those numbers. But I think, it, 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 Deputy, if I come to you just around um, uh, the diversity, equality, inclusion side and, and our plans for recruitment. Yeah, of course, Mike. Um, I'll cover it all off in terms of where we are. So uh, in terms of our officer numbers, uh, as you know, Commissioner, we are at 1645 in the organisation. We are going to meet our uplift numbers, which is a, a really, really good achievement for us. Uh, there is a focus on diversity and inclusion. And we've launched our new strategy and the positive action team in, in August this year with, with some clear priorities. Um, although it's early days, there's a lot of work going on by the positive action team, positive action champions in terms of what we're doing externally and internally around improving diversity representation um, we've missed some opportunities previously uh, around this with our recruitment around the overall officer numbers uh, but there are still a number of opportunities that we can exploit to encourage individuals of diverse backgrounds differences to join policing uh, an example of that is the work that's currently took you know has, has taken place very recently with customer contact in terms of with a positive action team and it'll be it'll be it's a continuous piece of work We've got pearl catchers in the organisation at the moment, which is something that I know the Commissioner's Office have supported with around um, improving the organisational understanding of diversity and inclusion and the importance of difference and belonging and things of that nature. So it is going to be a continuous picture. The, the, the numbers and data, as you can see, is, is as, as it is at the moment. Um, overall representation in our community is about 3.4%. That is going to change with a census data that's going to be released. We predict it'll be anything between 8 and 11%. Currently in the organisation, we're, we're at 2.6%. I can't quite see what it says on there. I think it's 2.6 for officers. Uh, but it's not where it needs to be. That's the reality of it. We need to be doing much more to make ourselves a much more attractive employer for people to come and join. Um, but there's a lot of work for us to do. But there's a lot of work ongoing, which I can give assurance around with the measures that we have put into place recently. In addition to that, the recruitment around PCSOs, if you just flick on a slide, Mike. Uh, we've previously explained the challenges around PCSO recruitment. It's probably one of the roles which is least um, sort of clicked on when we advertise compared to others. Um, there's uh, this is not just an issue for us as a force i know other forces are having very similar issues with regards to pcso recruitment uh, so there's some further work for us to do to understand how do we uh, attract people into that particular post moving forward and i think that's the end of the presentation sorry we ran over very slightly oh sorry <laughs> sickness yeah, just one more very quickly, just in terms of the sickness. We always, we're always seeing coronavirus, um, which we will continue to report on um, into next year as well, probably until at least July next year. It's, it's always one of the, the biggest uh, absence reasons. One of the points to raise, though, is that um, uh, of we've not been any higher than 3.6% uh, of our entire workforce off sick at any one point uh, in the last 12 months and that equates to around 2.3 percent for officers 1.4 percent um for staff um but we have seen obviously quite a lot of coronavirus uh, absences what we do do though around covid is as we know there's actually no isolation rules in terms of what, how you need to isolate now but what we make sure we do especially in those critical policing areas force control room being one is that we conduct a risk assessment with the individual over the phone in terms of symptoms and where they're actually working uh, and whether or not it's best that they actually work from home and isolate for a period of time until the infection goes and that's been continual throughout the time that we've dealt with uh, covid and 
and it will be continual uh, for as long as we continue to deal with it, which is why throughout the, the, the pandemic itself, we, we held some of the lowest sickness rates uh, across the region and the country, albeit we were very strict with how we dealt with that uh, and, and, and much more strict than potentially some other organisations or forces. But we needed to protect the actual critical workforce from a brag B status when we assessed the important critical roles and which ones we need to backfill and which ones we need to really keep an eye on. So that's something we will continue to do with uh, coronavirus. But uh, on average, our sickness is really low uh, as an organisation, which you know I'm really happy with. And that is um, the end of the uh, presentation, Commissioner. Apologies for going over. Uh, I'll blame it on Fiona. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, hopefully we've covered uh, most of the stuff that we need to. But take any questions at the end. Well, thank you. I think you've, uh, I think we actually, or myself, has slowed you down with asking so many questions, but I think the public would expect me to do that because such an important topic is the force control room and it's important to get out there, you know, what you're doing and you are making progress, but there is a long way to go. So thank you very much. Wow. Okay. So let's go back to the agenda, agenda item eight. There's no questions from the public. Um, agenda item nine, any other business, which there isn't. And agenda item 10, date of the next meeting, which will be January. So it's just really left for me to say thank you very much for watching and also taking part. We don't have a PAM meeting in December, but we'll have an extended one in January to compensate for that. And really, it leaves it for me because I'm not speaking to any of you um, public in, in December to wish you all a really wonderful and safe Christmas and very best wishes for the new year. OK. Stay safe, everyone, and thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.